Oh, to Eves everywhere. My name is Wendy Webster Coakley from the 35th reunion class of 1985. I'm also a member of the alumni relations staff. And today it is my great privilege to welcome you to the sixth annual Dwelling of the Gallant celebration, when we take time to honor all women and femme identifying alumni of Williams by sharing in the stories of four speakers from across the reunion classes. This program debuted five years ago at our last reunion as we began to approach the 50th anniversary of key milestones along our path to coeducation. Dwelling of the Gallant was envisioned and so appropriately named by my brilliant colleague Sharifa Wright, class of 2003, who is currently at home enjoying maternity leave with her own baby Eve woman. Many of you may know that the first fully co-ed class matriculated at Williams in 1971. But did you also know that 100 years earlier, the college was already thinking about, quote, the propriety of admitting women to pursue the college course of study with the other sex? That's right. In 1871, five men with familiar names like Bascom and Dewey and Hopkins were appointed to a committee to study the subject and make a recommendation at the annual meeting of the Society of Alumni just like the annual meeting we'll be having virtually tomorrow. So we obviously know the result. Williams did not follow the lead of pioneering institutions like Swarthmore and Maud Mandel's alma mater Oberlin, but the vote was closer than you might think. It was three to two against, and even the slim majority acknowledged the right of women to higher education. They just didn't think Williams was the right place for women because number one, Ephraim Williams established a school expressly for men, true. It was not a university with the expanded course offerings that women might desire, eh. And I think this was the clincher, public opinion regarding educating the sexes together was still quite divided among women and men alike. So for those of us, myself included, who assumed coeducation at Williams was a 20th century debate and decision, we learned something new today, thanks to our amazing college archives, which was preparing an exhibit about coeducation for this reunion when the pandemic hit. Regardless of how we got there, the four women you're about to meet, representing four points of time in our evolution as a co-ed institution, will open your eyes to not only how Williams helped shape them and their personal and professional journeys, but also how they as women impacted our beloved alma mater in ways large and small. So I'm gonna briefly introduce all four of them in presentation order, and then I'll turn things over to our first speaker. If we have time for questions at the end, you can submit them via the Q&A function. So our first speaker is going to be Virginia Cumberbatch from the class of 2010. As a scholar and organizer, Virginia's work sits at the intersection of community advocacy and storytelling. She is the co-founder of Rosa Rebellion, a platform for creative activism by and for women of color, and has served as director of equity and community advocacy and the Social Justice Institute for the University of Texas's Division of Diversity and Community Engagement. As part of her commitment to disrupt systemic racism and build resources for inclusive practices, she spoke at forums like South by Southwest and TEDx and develops workshops for corporations, nonprofits, and universities worldwide to explore and shift their own communities to diversity, inclusion, and equity. Virginia is a global shaper for the World Economic Forum and sits on a number of local boards. In 2017, she was appointed to the mayor of Austin's task force on institutional racism and systemic bias. She's a recipient of the Anti-Defamation League of Austin Social Justice Award, the Austin 40 Under 40 Award for Civics, Government, and Public Affairs, and the Girl Scouts of Central Texas Women of Distinction. She co-authored the book, As We Saw It, The Story of Integration at the University of Texas at Austin, which was published in 2018. And she holds a master's from the Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin. Our second speaker will be Elizabeth Suda from the class of 2005. After graduation, Elizabeth was curious to answer a simple question. How and by whom are the goods we consume made? 
After two years in the merchandising department at Coach, she packed her bags and traveled to Laos. She was without a plan, but prepared. Upon arrival, she began knocking on the doors of local women-based textile businesses. She was on a mission to understand how local sustainable crafts made by women could be plugged into the global fashion market. Recognizing that market linkage and design are major constraints on artisans, she founded Article 22 when she saw rural villagers melting U.S. bombs into spoons. Having studied history at Williams and Oxford, she was beguiled by her lack of awareness of the secret war in Laos from 1963 to 74, which left a legacy of 80 million unexploded bombs. She created the peace bomb bracelet with the idea of buying the bombs back. And since then, Article 22 has developed into a global business, selling an evolving collection of jewelry that celebrates transformation to customers in 40 countries, including actress and activist Emma Watson and some slightly less famous people as well. Sales of Article 22 jewelry have helped clear thousands of bombs from Laos. She counts among Article 22's achievements an invitation to Kensington Palace to celebrate Prince Harry's commitment to walk in his mother's footsteps toward a landmine-free 2025. Elizabeth and her work have been featured in the Wall Street Journal, LA Times, Vogue, Marie Claire, and by NPR and PBS NewsHour, to name just a few. Our third speaker is my classmate, Suan Ho of the class of 1985. After working in New York City as a young design professional, a Fulbright Fellowship funded Suen's field research of the notorious Kowloon walled city in Hong Kong. Her unique perspective of this urban enclave of extreme density has since been covered by the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and most recently the BBC. After the Fulbright, Suen joined her architect husband, John Flynn, and practiced in France before the couple settled in Oregon. Subsequently, an NEA fund grant funded Suen's artistic mapping of urban US Chinatowns. She and John co-founded Resolve Architecture and Planning. Their designs speak to history, culture, and heritage. They designed the award-winning Garden of Surging Waves which is an interpretive urban park fronting Astoria City Hall in its historic downtown. This bicentennial legacy project episodically reveals the life of early Astorian Chinese through custom designed sculptural installations. It is stunning. In addition to several design awards, Suen has received the Honored Citizen Award from the Chinese American Citizens Alliance. She's a daily Journal of Commerce Women of Vision honoree and received the Asian Pacific American Chamber of Commerce Most Distinguished Individual Award. Little known fact, Suen's mother, Chi Ping Lu, was a special student at Williams in the early 60s, thanks to her charismatic father, Tao Ho, class of 1960. They were married by Professor Dean Brooks in his peony field garden during graduation weekend. I love that story. And finally, our last speaker will be Ellen Sherberg from the class of 1970. Following a distinguished tenure as publisher of the St. Louis Business Journal, Ellen moved to the corporate team at American City Business Journals, which is the country's largest publisher of local business journals. In this role, she's created the Confidence Code for Girls Conference in Baltimore, Mentoring Monday, where 10,000 women across the country are mentored on the same day, Women Who Lead programs and numerous other events. She oversees Biz Women, the, national, the daily national website focused on providing news today's business women need to know. Ellen joined the St. Louis Business Journal in 1980 and has served as a reporter, managing editor, and editor. She's also been a group publisher for American City Business Journals with responsibility for the business journals in Birmingham, sorry, Birmingham, Memphis, Orlando, and Dallas, receiving numerous journalism awards along the way. Before joining the Business Journal, Ellen worked as a radio reporter and for the St. Louis Globe Democrat. As a freelance writer, she has articles published in Time, Newsweek, The National Observer, Parents Magazine, Seventeen, and Working Women Magazine. She holds a master's degree in journalism from Columbia. 
Ellen is a philanthropic force in St. Louis, serving on numerous boards. Most notably, she's the founder of the Women's Leadership Initiative for their United Way that has raised more than $110 million for the local community. Ellen is a graduate of Vassar College, who also identifies with the Williams College Class of 1970. And I have no doubt she'll talk about the critically important role that exchange students and transfers from the women's schools and particularly Vassar, played in the move to co-education at Williams. Those of us who followed owe all of them a great debt. So thank you ladies for being with us today. We're now going to turn the podium over to Virginia. Good afternoon. Um, I want to start by thanking Williams and the alumni team for the work they do every day to create a space for us to be empowered and encouraged. Um, and I want to thank them especially for this special invitation. Uh, what a privilege and an honor to virtually stand before all of you, my peers, predecessors, and inspirations, and be trusted to contribute some words of meaning for this celebration. Um, I also want to provide just a little bit of um, uh, a piece of information that unfortunately I'm gonna have to jump off this Zoom um, meeting to attend um, another event here in Austin that I'm also speaking at, but I am so excited for the incredible words I know you guys are gonna hear um, from these other amazing women. So as I reflected on the vision and mission of the Dwelling of the Gallant, a space created to recognize and celebrate the presence and contributions of women in the purple bubble, some unsettled feelings arose. The idea of honoring our voices as women while beautiful did not entirely reflect my identity or my experience at Williams. It is this constant dance of race and gender and the few opportunities presented to embody, discuss, and celebrate both that marks my beginnings in the Berkshires. The common thread at my time at Williams that has since informed the work that I do now is a lens of which I pursued it, is the power of story and the presence of history. Sure, it was my major, but it also shaped my understanding of race, space, and place. What I observed as a child growing up in a mostly white Austin and the language I acquired in the mountains of the Berkshires have all worked to reconcile in my adulthood have large, can largely be summed up by these words. Without documentation, individual experiences and institutional knowledge are lost, and consequently the breadth of cultural processes and contributions are either abbreviated or in some cases altogether eradicated. This is directly linked to a call to value Black lives today. This is directly connected to the toxicity and sometimes the functions of privilege. Without the value of our history, stories, and contributions and voices, we continue to drive both direct and subconscious understandings of who gets to navigate what space. In preparation for my works today, I began to reflect through context of history and the voices of some women that I admire. I found myself less interested in skipping through memory lane and more convicted to offer a call to action to you today. So this afternoon, I ask for your patience and ask that you join me in exploration of redefining, reimagining, and recommitting to what it looks like to support and celebrate all EF women as individuals and as a collective. Let's imagine what dwelling of the Galent would look like should we consider our roles as agitators and as people who have the ability to elevate and disrupt not just women, not just people of color, but as people who consider the purple bubble to be a place of connection and community. So as I consider what set intention provided inspiration for my time at Williams, it was most certainly modeled by what my parents demonstrated, what I saw as living an intentional life of purpose that manifested shalom, the Greek or Hebrew word that means whole or peace. My adventure to the Berkshires was informed and consistently challenged by an exploration of what my role would be in bringing shalom to the world. This notion, this idea was definitely even more inspired by a particular woman, a black woman who I also call my grandmother. Dr. Sylvia Rousseau, who's now 82 years old, also served as the first black woman to graduate from Wake Forest University. A woman who received her PhD at 50, a mother of five, a grandmother of 16, a former teacher, principal, superintendent, and UOC professor. But see, her legacy is not so much these titles or what some would deem as impressive accolades, but instead her legacy rests in the moments of inconvenience and the decisions she's always made to support black and brown girls 
and to create a legacy that served to disrupt spaces that were never meant for people that looked like me or her. My grandmother once asked me a question, where do you see yourself on the map of human geography? How will your life purpose serve to manifest the dreams of your grandparents and make way for those alongside you and behind you? Side note, she asked me this question at nearly 13. So you can imagine summers in LA were super, super exciting. These questions, however, guided me in questioning where, why there was no diversity or inclusion committee my freshman year, to challenging institutional policies and practices, and leading me to pursue a study in both history and sociology. What many of us had failed to realize in our time at Williams is that these community institutions, landmarks, and narratives of people of color have, of, who have been marginalized and undocumented serve to set a precedent for how we are valued in those spaces. It's important to note that this is not an isolated example of cultural erasure at Williams or in higher, edu higher education, but so much so as a country. We have systemically removed the stories of people of color, whether through policies, political dissonance, or economic or social apathy. As such, I often meditate on the remarks of Martin Luther King in his 1957 address to his congregation entitled Conquering Self-Centeredness. He wrote, an individual has not started living fully until they can rise above the narrow confines of individualistic concerns to the broader concerns of humanity. Now, I cannot confirm the emotional state or the social reverberations of his remarks at the time, but I can confidently deduce, given the similarities of our social context and political climate, that it wasn't so much a pep talk as much as a admonishment, a warning that the journey to equity, the road to justice, would require much more than good intentions or liberal ideals or progressive bumper stickers that we went to Williams, or even woke tweets, or even the claim to love everyone around us. You know, I believe his words were a critique of America and perhaps our community here at Williams. I believe he was calling us into an understanding of how to truly pursue equity and justice, not just in elevating the voices of women, not just in elevating the, women, the people of color, but creating a space that truly could be owned and shared by all of us. So I ask us today, how will we proceed not just to live up to our title as people who have or are receiving degrees from the number one liberal arts college in the country, but embody a life of intentional impact and justice? And as I ponder the consequences of our complacency or even as our satisfaction to have incredible moments of celebration like today, I consider what it would look like if we all pursued this year all pursued our understanding about what it meant to be an alumni of this beautiful institution, to be those who serve to elevate voices, agitate normative practices, and disrupt systems to transform lives. As I reflected on my Williams trajectory since graduating 10 years ago, which is hard to say out loud, I think it's very easy in this space of elitism or privilege or all inspiring intellect to wear a badge of honor for attending this beautiful institution, that we can be coaxed into a posture of complacency or complicity, rather than leaving the opportunity to leverage these incredible resources, intellect, innovation, and joy that comes from being an Eve to agitate, disrupt, and dismantle. Because amongst the beauty and the convenience of these narratives rests a history that may not provide an opportunity for us to truly be an institution of equity. I wrote the below words 10 years ago alongside my peers and best friends, Elise Johnson and Gianna Hutton, who also serve as members of the class of 2010. These words ring true as we witness this country engage in important conversations around justice, civil liberties, and human, and human rights. We asked the question 10 years ago, where our landmarks were as women of color. And as I prepared to take what I learned the previous three years of history and sociology and anthropology in my senior year, I wondered how these intellectual exercises would help me leap into adulthood. Those answers came in the form of self-discovery, friendship, and a winter study. Curious of the footsteps that treaded before our arrival in 2006, Gianna, Elise, and myself proposed a research project interviewing the first Black women to enter Williams. Surprised that we had that it had only happened 30 years before, and infuriated by the fact that in our last year at Williams, we had failed to hear, see, or know their stories. This winter, project, winter study project 
and spring break road trip and eventual thesis gave us language to our lived experiences. Last night, I found that thesis and was struck by the words we wrote nearly a decade ago. History and memory are the containers for grievance. Having been exposed to and inspired by the seemingly and unexplored stories of Williams', Williams African-American, Latina, and Asian female students from the early 1970s when they arrived at college, we were prompted to document this historical narrative. We hope to enlighten our peers about a history pertinent to their experience and existence on the Williams campus. As I reflected on those words by, by those incredible young ladies, I think of the work we set in motion. I think of the healing we offer not only to ourselves by seeing ourselves in these women's voices, but the gift we left Williams in connecting their stories to the collective story of Williams and each of you today. I think Andre Lord wrote it most poignantly. Where the words of men and women are crying to be heard, we must each of us recognize the responsibility to seek those words out, to read them and share them and examine them and their pertinence to our lives. There are so many silences to be broken. So in my four years at Williams and now my five years at the University of Texas at Austin as Director of Equity and Community Advocacy and co-founder of an organization that serves to elevate the voices of women of color, it's this weird act of poetry and symmetry that I found myself retracing this idea of exploring untold stories. After the fall of 2014 and the murder of Trayvon Martin, I pursued publishing a book called As We Saw It, The Story of Integration at the University of Texas. In that process, I have learned the profound need for us to not only honor our own stories as women and particularly as people of color, but the work and role that we have in starting to elevate the untold, sometimes silent stories of those around us. So as we celebrate the dwelling of a gala and we look to elevate this, the voices of women, not just today, but every day, I ask us to consider how we disrupt the often normative behavior around telling stories, valuing experiences and honoring contribu contributions both here at Williams and our everyday walk. Dr. Angela Deza said, I'm not free while any woman is unfree, even when her shackles are very different from my own. These are the realities and questions that I ponder as I sit with you today in this Zoom call, 10 years from the day I cross the stage. As a leader institution's vision around community access and equity and develop an organization innately and intentionally building a table to elevate the voices of women. What do we need to grab by the roots? How can we push forward to move beyond just this idea of diversity and equity, but truly to a place of equity and justice? So today I encourage you to seek how you can live that mandate out to the fullest by identifying your personal mission, motive, and mandate. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you all this afternoon, and thank you in advance for the change we'll make starting tomorrow to elevate, engage, and empower those who have been marginalized, who have been silenced, and who have been siloed. We have an incredible opportunity as women, but particularly as ETH women, to serve as purveyors of equity and justice. So let's continue to go to work, ladies. Let's continue the movement not only to transform our lives, but our communities, our country, and our world. Thank you guys for having me. Um, Virginia, thank you for your incredible eloquence and message. Um, my name is Elizabeth Suda. Um, Williams, thank you for having me. I am truly, truly touched to be here among these talented women. When I received this invitation, I was first surprised, um, then elated and replied immediately, yes. Then last night, the panic set in, just as if I was back in my freshman dorm on top floor of Morgan, overlooking Route 2 in the church, just as if I was shamefully, shamefully last minute and pulling my thoughts together for a paper. But then I remembered the crisp, calm, fall leaf peeping days and very, very, very long winters that extended into May. I started my freshman year off as a member of the Frosh Review. As a sophomore, I flew from the rafters as the angel in Angels in America. I remember being so intimidated, but not only of the height, intimidated by the duty I felt to the script and by the outstanding cast, which had much more experience than I did. As a junior, I studied abroad at Oxford with the Williams Exeter program and enjoyed terrifying one-on-one -on -one tutorials. I almost made it to the stage at Oxford, but didn't quite make the cut to play an American in Arthur Miller's All My Sons. That year left me with lifelong friendships and also made me discover and 
truly respect how completely different cultures can be despite sharing a common language. Then back to Williams for senior year with my last stage performance in Eve Ensler's The Vagina Monologues. As if I wasn't nervous enough to say the word vagina on stage, I was cast with the part of performing multiple orgasms. Thank you, O5 friend and director, Lily Zemet. You are a rascal. In writing this, I realized, geez, I've been afraid a lot. And that was no less true my senior year when I took my first philosophy class. On top of it being my last semester, class was three days a week at 8.30 a.m. with the edgy religion and philosophy professor, Mark Taylor. It was one of my favorite classes, despite the fact that I was super anxious through the end because we had to code a website as part of the final. Code a website. What came as more of a surprise, though, is that philosophy class called Real Fakes got me my first job a few months later in fashion at Coach. But that's a story for another day. I applied to Coach through a posting by a Williams alumna on the website of Office of Career Counseling. Frankly, I had absolutely no idea what I wanted to do with my life, but I got the job and I was excited to learn. It was the perfect role for me because like the history courses I had taken, it was interdisciplinary. I was responsible for working with different cross-functional partners along the supply chain, including product developers, working with factories in India and China. I became curious about the people making the products thousands of miles away. I started to think about sustainability and the harmful environmental effects and human rights abuses of fast fashion. This prompted me to apply for a Fulbright to study in India, organic cotton and artisanal weaving. Despite the generous support of Lynn Chick Fellowships Coordinator at Williams and Professor Taylor's recommendation, as well as other fashion industry professionals, I actually didn't get the Fulbright. I always say though that it was my best failure ever because it brought me to Laos. I self-funded my trip and landed there in 2008 just as the market tumbled into recession back home in New York and President Obama was on the campaign trail. My flight arrived from Bangkok. On the visa line, I start up a conversation with another American from Louisiana and I lament, oh, I'm so uncultured with regard to my own country because I've made it to Laos before New Orleans. But one day I'll get there because I have a friend from Lafayette. His name is Paul. The other passenger looks startled and says, Paul Simone, I went to Williams. And in shock, I said, I went to Williams. Andy Shabelman was a year behind me as it turns out. And we spent the first few days discovering Vientiane, the capital of Laos together. I guess you call it synchronicity. I went to Laos to understand the sustainable traditions of natural dyeing and handloom weaving and understand what that could mean in the context of international development and the global fashion market. It was evident that Lao women weavers I met held ancient wisdom that was inherently sustainable. A textile consulting project for Swiss NGO Helvetas brought me to meet with weavers in the northern village of Ban Napia. It is there that I became what I call, I guess, an accidental entrepreneur. I asked them what other things were made in the village and they led me to a shed of jagged pieces of scrap metal. A woman held my hand and then with her other hand picked up a piece that had English writing on it. Rocket mortar, it read. Back out in the garden, a woman sitting at an earthen kiln was pouring molten metal from these jagged shards into soup spoons. It was the same soup spoon I'd eaten my noodle soup with that morning for breakfast. I'd eaten my breakfast with a soup spoon made from American bombs dropped during the secret war in Laos. The US was secretly bombing Laos and killing innocent civilians despite a treaty that committed to the country's neutrality during the Vietnam War. I, I was shocked. How wasn't this in my history books? How didn't I know about the 250 million bombs that were dropped and the 80 million that failed to detonate on impact? You know, these villagers were farming their contaminated farmland because of bombs dropped by my, com my country. And yet they welcome me, an American, with open arms, hearts, and stomachs to their lunch table. Since the 1970s, they were transforming this devastation into soup spoons to rebuild their lives and feed their community. So I became an accidental entrepreneur the moment I thought, if they can make spoons, they can make bracelets. And I will do my best to sell them and to tell a missing 
piece of history, the secret war, and launch a campaign to buy back the bombs. So together with the artists and families, we took their local innovation global through a bracelet and now a full collection of jewelry. And each piece tells their story of resilience and creativity. And they've shared it in their own words with journalists from the BBC and PBS NewsHour. In addition, each family has also been engaged in the slow but steady process of decontaminating their land because jewelry purchases have contributed to Article 22's NGO partner, 1997 Nobel Peace Prize co laureate Minds Advisory Group, to clear thousands of bombs from nearly 500,000 square meters of bomb littered land. I have learned so much from my friends in Laos. I have learned patience. At the current rate of removal, it will take decades to clear the land. I have also learned from them that sustainability is itself a mindset that is rooted in culture. I see how it is woven into the fabric of their society, daily practices and beliefs. It is fragile because as long as it takes to weave, it can be destroyed overnight when there is too much imbalance between the economic, environmental, social and cultural. That is why pursuing a path towards sustainability in the days and decades ahead requires an interdisciplinary approach. It requires businesses to have missions beyond profit, and it requires those businesses to collaborate with governments and nonprofits. It requires inclusivity, intersectionality, accurate histories, and public-private partnership. It requires citizen activists who take the time to vote at the ballot machine as well as the cash register. You know, my, my Russian Revolution history course taught by Professor Bill Wagner made me a history major because it was there that I realized the role of performers and writers and artists doubled as activists. Known as constructivists, they were to be constructors of a new society, cultural workers on par with scientists in their search for solutions to modern problems. This, no doubt, subconsciously led me to found a fashion company and name it Article 22 after the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And while these ideas are big and broad, I return to what I have learned from my friends in Laos and Lao American activists like Chanapa Kambongsa, who played an instrumental role in bringing President Barack Obama to Laos in 2016 to publicly acknowledge the secret war and commit 90 million to clear unexploded bombs. I have learned the power of long-term commitment balanced with focus on the present moment. I wish to see all the bombs cleared in Laos, but in the meantime, I count every bracelet sold and every square meter of land cleared as its own triumph because incremental change adds up even though it's not always quantifiable. Because how can you quantify the peace of mind of a farmer who no longer has to grow rice in fear or a mother and father who no longer have to worry that their child might pick up a cluster bomb, mistaking it for a toy. You can't quantify inner peace. The first time I was asked why I do this was by author and activist, activist Fred Brantman. He was the man who testified before an unwitting Congress that despite a treaty that deemed Laos neutral, there were daily clandestine bombing raids indiscriminately killing innocent civilians. In our short documentary, also incidentally um, supported by many Williams grads, including some 75 grads who are celebrating with us uh, today. In our short documentary called Buying Back the Bombs, he told me, it shook me up on the deepest level possible because it meant that everything I had been taught and everything I believed about America wasn't true. I'm not sure that I answered Fred that day, but what I know is that I wanted the things I had learned about my beloved and highly, highly imperfect country to be true. And somewhere along the line, I must have remembered Professor Taylor's words during our final class. He asked us, if it's not you, then who? I am hopeful that the way people are living history right now will manifest how and by whom that history is written with accuracy, intersectionality, inclusivity, so that the state of California doesn't continue to deny the inclusion of Laos studies in the curriculum. So it doesn't take 99 years since the massacre on Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma to make it to statewide curriculum. Facts matter. 
firsthand accounts of the same events told from multiple perspectives matter. For me, through Article 22, that has meant using jewelry to revisit history and to prompt people who wear it to start hard conversations. That's why we expanded the collection a year ago to tell stories and share the messages of different artists and activists from Laos to the US and beyond. At the risk of sounding trite, from wherever we are and with whatever talents we have, we can all make a difference. The interdependence of our global ecosystem has become more evident with COVID-19 global pandemic. We are truly in this together. And I tell myself that as Article 22's role and our business evolves, I will have to continue to step into the unknown and uncertainty and just do it and do it afraid. So thank you so much for letting me share my thoughts. And now I'm happy to introduce Sue and Ho. Thank you. Um, that was a wonderful story. Um, I'm Swen Ho, class of 85, and I'm going to share my screen with you. My uncle Chen Ho was class of 57, and my father Tao Ho was class of 60. My mom, Chi Ping Lu, was sweet talked by my father, and she followed him to Williams and study here as the only woman on an all male campus. Unfortunately, for some reason, she was not on any official record at Williams. All I got was her humorous stories and her diary. Little did I realize, without any official credentials, her stories became stories of a nobody. You're looking at a photo of my mom at Williams 60 years ago. My grandfather wrote in his photo album, Dean Brooks gave, gave the bride away. I'm gonna move forward to the next one. Fast forward, I really enjoyed and loved my Williams experience. I was challenged intellectually and unlike the force-fed top-down Hong Kong schooling, professors here were genuinely interested in what I thought. Williams prepared me well for my learning at Columbia University with degrees in art and architecture from Williams and Columbia. The self-confident me was anxious to tackle a 10-month Fulbright-funded fellowship of a dangerous filthy place in Hong Kong that I was never allowed to visit. As a young urban designer, I was intrigued by this aerial photo and wanted to find out what was behind this massive urban form. The infamous Kowloon Wall City in Hong Kong before it was demolished, it was known as the highest density urban enclave with an estimated 35 to 50,000 living in an area of 40, uh, 400 foot by 700 foot, similar to the square footage of two New York City blocks in Manhattan. Many labeled the Kowloon Wall City as an urban slum that was filthy, lawless, and dangerous. The government attempted to demolish it numerous times, yet the residents refused to leave. At the beginning, I was on the ground taking photos and video. I tried to ans find answers to my list of architectural centric questions, such as, what do you think about the Kowloon Wall City's spatial hierarchy? Soon I realized that I was overly naive. The 10 month engagement with the residents humbled me. All my intellectual inquiries did not mean anything to the residents who feared of losing their homes and businesses. I learned how to shut up and listen to their stories. I made friends, the great grandma and her great granddaughter who invited me to join them at their last dinner before the next morning's forced eviction. The soon to be evicted Dr. Guo who allowed residents to plaster his clinic with written protest. Then the police and firemen charged in. 
desperate souls reluctantly emerged. For the past 30 years since the demolition of the wall city, I have been asked what it was like to be there witnessing the last breath of this notorious urban enclave. Yes, I was a witness. However, I have been emphasizing that we need to look past the labeling. We need to learn from the positive aspects of the Kowloon Wall City. The ingredients that bond the Kowloon Wall City's residents were self-sufficient, resilient, and contribute to the large, larger community. We can all creatively apply the positive lessons and improve our high density living. This is us. We are in this together. Astoria is the oldest U.S. settlement west of the Rockies, founded before there was the state of Oregon. It, was, it has a historic downtown at the mouth of the mighty Columbia River. This public urban plaza is the bicentennial legacy project that commemorates the contribution of the thousands of early Chinese immigrants who helped develop the city. The challenge was that most of the Chinese had left the town due to discrimination, and most townies never heard the stories. Instead of telling the dark side of the sufferings, I put the stories of the Astorian Chinese in the context of the 5,000 years of Chinese civilization with oral history and stories of the early Chinese workers through a mosaic of textures and colors. The story screen that has many endearing, endearing floating quotes started with my grandfather, my mother, The Garden of Surging Ways became Astoria's first town square. Fronting the city hall, it is a place for all to enjoy their festivals, weddings, vigils, and contemplate with stories of sweat, tears, and laughter. It was a lot of fun to showcase two historic basket bridges by bringing in the voices of the third fourth and fifth graders who travel these bridges daily. On one side, the installation co is covered with the young artists' sketches and poems that are poignant and insightful. On the other side, we have the master bridge engineer's 1919 hand-drafted drawings and historic photos of the bridges. It was a joy to daylight the retired historic years after lifting the bridge span for more than 90 years in the dark. We recently finished installing another public installation of an outdoor museum along a three quarter mile long heritage trail. Display on the six interpretive stations are little known stories of the early immigrants and pioneers of African Palalupuya tribe, Mexican, Japanese, Chinese, and Aus Austrian heritage in a very white town in Tiger, Oregon. This, the, at the end of the trail, Rotary members commissioned a custom designed street clock. This is the first time I had the opportunity to design an installation that tells the passing of time. I did not realize how difficult it was to prepare for an eight minute presentation. A similar duration of time was all it took to murder George Floyd, an ordinary man whose personal stories are now shared across the world. His senseless death and the resulting movement reflect who we are as humans living together on this planet. If we pause and make the effort to listen to stories of the unheard, perhaps we will all be able to relate and appreciate that we are all in this together. Thank you. And now I'm going to turn the screen to Alan.
by virtue of the semester that we spent at Williams. They are accomplished, strong, smart, and kind. And each of them deserves to be addressing you more than I do by virtue of their involvement with both Williams and Vassar from whence we came. Our college experience spanned a period of intense social change. Unlike anything I've witnessed, well, until the last past few weeks. When we arrived at Vassar in the fall of 1966, we had to take a rules test before we were permitted to meander off campus. By the time we left in the chaotic spring of 1970, there were no longer any rules. During our freshman convocation, then Vassar President Alan Simpson suggested we were being educated to be the wives of future leaders. At our graduation, we pinned white peace symbols on our black caps and made for a dramatic picture, which was featured on the front page of the New York Times. Our commencement speaker was a striking young activist named Gloria Steinem, who issued a clarion call for feminism. In between, the world had changed. There was a black student takeover at Maine, the Vassar senior dorm. We virtually shut down the campus following the Cambodia incursion. We didn't get our grades last semester because classes had been halted. And in between, for me and for about 30 other Vassar women, there was Williams, which not only prepared many of us to thrive in this changing world, but to be change makers ourselves. I'm going to tell you my very favorite Williams story, which stars Professor Russell Bostert. He was an iconic and imposing figure in the history department. He taught, and this is going to age me if nothing else has, a course called America as a Major World Power. I was the only woman in his class. So picture a scene out of the movie Paper Chase, where a college professor seems to have an instinct for calling on unprepared young men and peppering them with questions. Throughout the semester, I witnessed otherwise strong, competent juniors and seniors reduced to sniveling puddles. I sensed Professor Bostert wouldn't do that to me if he could avoid it. So I prepared hard for one question and raised my hand. Usually he ignored students who appeared eager to answer, but he made an exception and he called on me. He parried a bit, threw me some relatively easy questions, and I knew I was going to survive. On the very last day of class, I joined the other students as we paraded through the door, each shaking Professor Bostert's hand. Sounds a little quaint now, doesn't it? As I approached him, he stopped and briskly walked to his desk, where he reached down, pulled out a box of Kleenex, which he handed to me. You know, he said, when they told me a girl had registered for my class, I didn't know what to do. I had never been in a classroom with a female, not in my early education, not at prep school, and not at Williams. I brought I bought these tissues because I thought you might need them, but you didn't. That was then. Flash forward to Williams today, when it's being led by a strong, smart, kind woman. How far we've come. When I visited the campus a few years back, I was struck not only by the number of women walking around, but by the lighting. Walking to the library in times past was treacherous. Today's Williams is a safer place for many, as is the world, but not safe enough, and not safe enough for enough of us. For once in my life, I had actually drafted these remarks early, actually several months ago when I expected to be on the campus this weekend with all of you. Clearly, the world has changed, and so has this brief. I was going to herald the change we have lived through and tell you that I no longer need Professor Bostert's Kleenex. Sadly, that's no longer the case. And these remarks are directed particularly to my classmates. Because for people like me, who are well-educated and privileged in many ways, including the privilege of having lived through great change, retirement, I believe, is no longer an option. For some of us, that might be the case financially, especially with what's happening with the market today. For others, there are physical challenges. But for the rest who have survived this long and experienced this much, I think it's important to remember Professor Bostert's class, to acknowledge what we don't know, 
and to be prepared to be challenged. We need to be in class, literally and figuratively, with people who don't look or act like us. Like Professor Bostert, we need to cut some slack to those we don't know and those we have never met. Williams wasn't ready for women in 1970. We slept in the children's room of the former football coach's house. It was awkward all the way around. But Williams adopted and adapted quickly and brilliantly. Those who are on this panel today are testimonial to what can be accomplished. And then there's that well-lit, beautiful campus with an exceptional woman leader. When I was at Williams, I was told what may be one of many apocryphal stories. A well-regarded political science major allegedly approached his beloved professor, and he told him he was so inspired by the Williams experience, he was going to follow in his footsteps and gain a PhD in political science. The professor was stunned and visibly disappointed. I feel I failed, he said, shaking his head. Why would that be, the student asked. I want to be a teacher, just like you. Ah, the professor replied. At Williams, we are here to create leaders, not teachers. That's a different message than the one we heard at the beginning of our Vassar education, when we were encouraged to be the wives of leaders. That's how Williams changed me and many, many others. I saw myself as a leader with responsibility to change the world. That's the work that continues for all of us. And Remember to bring your Kleenex. Thank you for having me. Well, that was absolutely incredible. Ellen, Sue Ann, Elizabeth, and Virginia, who had to depart early. Unfortunately, speaking of departing early, um, we are, this Zoom space, the Zoom meeting room, is going to be taken over by some other programming, uh, reunion programming. So unfortunately, we don't have time for Q&A. Um, but I want to thank all of you who took time to, to attend this. Um, and uh, please tell your friends who weren't able to make it to watch the recording, because I just think the wisdom that's been imparted by these women 